Ladies and gentlemen, um, and we're now uh, going to move to our second session. Um, this deals with the question, really, of the relations between three areas, um, Western Europe, um, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and Russia. And it's fair to say that each of these areas, these regions, countries, have somewhat different ideas at the moment uh, about democracy, what it is, um, what adjective should precede it, uh, liberal, majoritarian, progressive. And um, it's also true that the, um, that the element of confusion here is being exploited to some degree by uh, the Russian government's um, interpretation of democracy and the ways in which it tries to persuade people through a very efficient and very slick um, um, information and propaganda apparatus. So I'm going to um, invite the three panelists, beginning with uh, David Satter, to address this. Um, we have, uh, you have all the information about them in the folder. Um, they are respectively uh, Norman Stern, a very distinguished historian, uh, David Satter, uh, a, a distinguished journalist, um, and Miriam Lexman, a distinguished public servant, both in um, having been a Slovak diplomat and now working um, for the International Republican Institute. And I think the European, the, the, the think tank of the uh, European People's Party. So um, I'm not going to go beyond that. I'm simply going to invite um, David Satter to begin by addressing us, and later I'll be inviting the two panelists to comment and take the argument further. David. want to make sure I keep track of the time. Um, well, thanks, thank you all for coming, and thank you, John, for the invitation. John and I are old friends back from the days of the Soviet Union, when I used to write for National Review and write for him specifically about the dramatic events that were taking place during the perestroika period, when uh, history really accelerated in Russia, and each day and, e and each week brought new and completely unexpected changes to the Soviet Union and eventually led to the demise of the Soviet Union. I mean, uh, Gibbon said that what was remarkable about the Roman Empire was not its extent, but that it lasted for 600 years. And what was remarkable about the Soviet Union was the fact that it disappeared in such a record time and with so little effort seemingly to resist its own demise. All of this points to the fact that uh, Russia is a place that uh, uh, is capable of surprise, surprising us, is capable of unexpected developments, and often confounds our expectations. Present-day Russia poses a real challenge to the West. It's a challenge not only in terms of military, political, and intellectual competition, but also uh, it's a challenge in terms of the difficulty that is it often accompanies attempts to understand it. We have a wide variety of opinions, as you know, in the West. Uh, there are some people who, who insist that Russia is an aggressor state, that it's a ruthless dictatorship, that it's capable of, mo of monstrous crimes. Uh, there are others who say that Russia is horrifically misunderstood and that, in fact, its true benign intentions are not grasped by those who are always seeking fault in a country which has a different conception of its culture and civilizational path. <laughs> I think that the core of the misunderstanding may come from actually uh, a, a characteristic of Russia which is historically rooted. I, I've often considered the fact and reflected on the fact that it's not an accident that the bear is the national symbol of Russia. 
Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with bears, but uh, bears are prone to mimicry. And if there's one thing that confuses the West about Russia, it's the Russian tendency toward mimicry. Uh, we have parliaments in the West. There's a parliament in Russia. We have courts in the West. There are courts in Russia. We have media in the West. Russia has all of those things. It also has media. Of course, the parliament uh, always supports the government. When they voted on the annexation of Crimea, there was only one a uh, deputy in the parliament who objected, and he's now in exile in Ukraine. Uh, the courts are completely controlled, and the media is in the hands of a ruthless propaganda apparatus, but the appearances are preserved. And those appearances are convincing to many people. S because even though democracy in Russia, such as it was, has been hollowed out, the appearance of democratic institutions continues to exist and continues to serve a useful function by making Russia seem to be something slightly different or even a great deal different from what it is. Well, how did we get into this situation and what are its implications for the West? Actually, there were landmarks on the road to the creation of this hollowed out democracy and uh, uh, it, they should have been noticeable earlier, but they were perfectly clear almost from the very beginning after the fall of the Soviet Union. Russia was faced with the transformation of economic structures in 1991-92, and it proceeded to transform a state-run economy into a con an economy based on private ownership at record speed. The reason for the, for the haste was actually not uh, because of the economic needs of the population, but rather because those who were directing the process were determined that, one, that the process of creating private ownership in Russia would be irreversible, regardless of the will of the population. What took place was the largest peaceful transfer of property in human history. And it occurred, for the most part, within the space of th two or three years. Under those circumstances, it mattered very little in whose hands the property was placed. It mattered not at all that those were criminal hands. What was important was that the state was being freed of property, it was being put into the hands of private persons, and the market would sort everything out in the long run. In other words, the basic assumptions of communist ideology about the priority of economic processes and the subordination to those processes of the law and all ethical considerations were preserved in the new era. Well, the result, of course, was the criminalization of the entire country. <laughs> When the economic transformation plunged Russia into unprecedented poverty and the gross national product in Russia was cut in half uh, during the years of so-called reform, that didn't happen even under Nazi occupation. The death rate in Russia reached uh, levels that are only seen in wartime. Western demographers, when they saw the figures could not believe that Russia was evincing the kind of death rate under peaceful conditions, supposedly peaceful conditions, that they were seeing. But <clears throat> the population was massively opposed to the process. And the political leadership reacted in 1993 by uh, dispersing the parliament, a completely illegal act to this day, that the October 1993 dispersal by force of the Russian parliament is not very well understood. It was preceded by a massacre at the Astankano tele television tower, where angry de demonstrators, many of them with communist and fascist inclinations, but nonetheless unarmed, 
were shot down uh, with uh, automatic weapons by soldiers positioned behind fortified uh, positions uh, in this television tower and without warning. That massacre was taken to be justification for the shelling of the White House where the members of parliament were holed up to resist the illegal uh, order of pres then President Yeltsin to, uh, ab uh, to, to, to abolish the parliament. And that was the end of the separation of powers in Russia. From that point on, what was created was a super presidency, unaccountable to anyone, massively corrupt, and capable of carrying out any illegal action, including a war on Russia's own territory, without any type of popular control. The results for Russia were catastrophic. The population uh, did not support and did not approve of the Yeltsin leadership to the point that in 1998, Yeltsin had a popularity rate rating of only 2%. Now, so sociologists insist that in any public opinion poll, 6% of the respondents don't understand the question. So if he had a 2% popularity rating, and if his hand-picked successor, Vladimir Putin, a person no one had ever heard of, had a popularity rating of 2%, it can be asked whether anyone in Russia really supported Yeltsin or supported his would-be successor. Summer of 1999, shortly before new elections were supposed to take place, I was in Moscow at the time, uh, was an extremely tense time in Moscow. Uh, the Russian capital was awash in rumors that something big was going to happen, some type of massive provocation. Uh, there were different opinions as to what that provocation was going to be. Some people said that there would be a war between criminal gangs on the street of Mo streets of Moscow. It would be used as an excuse to impose martial law and cancel the elections. Other people said that leading celebrities would be taken hostage and uh, that would be the excuse for canceling the election. Some people said that there would be an attack on government buildings. No one was sure. Everyone had their own interpretation. Uh, and then suddenly apartment buildings in Russia began to be blown up. First in Buenaksk, in the Dagestan region, then two apartment buildings in Moscow, then an apartment building in Volgodonsk. The result was to terrify the entire country. Uh, the apartment buildings that were chosen for these terrorist acts were, ordinary, were the ordinary workers' apartment blocks uh, in depressed areas, and the result was that the Russian population saw what was happening as an attack on ordinary people. Vladimir Putin, who had newly been appointed prime minister, said that he was, that we were going to destroy the terrorists whom he identified as Chechens, without proof, by the way, and to this day there is still no proof. The Chechens have always denied they had anything to do with it. Not a single piece of evidence exists that Chechens had anything to do with those bombings. He, he said, we'll destroy them wherever they are. If we catch them in the toilets, we'll destroy them in the toilets. He used Russian prison slang. The Russian word is machit, which means liquidate. That's uh, a term from you, Rus the Russian criminal world. But it captured perfectly the population's desire for revenge. A new war was launched in Chechnya, even more sanguinary and vicious than the first Chechen war. Uh, it was pursued successfully. Putin became an overnight hero. From a gray non-entity, he emerged as the savior of the country, and he was elected president. His first act as president was to pardon Yeltsin for all crimes and to announce there'd be no revision of the criminal process of privatization. 
that had so destroyed the economy of the country and led to so much hardship and was so dishonest. Uh, and it, all, everything would have worked perfectly, actually, had it not been for one mistake. Uh, a bomb was placed in the basement of a building in Ryazan, a city southeast of, of Moscow, and it was discovered and defused. The city was cordoned off, and the persons who had placed the bomb were arrested. They turned out to be not Chechen terrorists, but agents of the FSB, the Federal Security Police. Authorities had, had for two days had been announcing that a terrorist act had been averted, uh, now had to explain why it was that FSB agents were caught having put the bomb, were, that, that the persons who put the bomb in the building, which was tested positive for hexagon, the high explosive used in the previous bombs, uh, why those people were FSB agents. And uh, Nikolai Patrashev, who was the head of the FSB, said that actually this was a training exercise uh, to, the, to the astonishment of the, of, of, of the entire city and the entire country and to those in the world who were paying attention. Uh, but uh, with fast-moving events, uh, the lack of a civil society in Russia, uh, a war situation in Chechnya, a new election coming up, uh, the true le meaning of the Ryazan incident was overlooked or at least was suppressed. Those who later tried to investigate it were one by one, and one, by one assassinated. And uh, Putin took power and emerged uh, as a leading political figure. The Russian economy, on the strength of soaring prices for raw materials, took off uh, for the, the, and began to expand after years of economic ca catastrophe, which won Putin popularity. The West, presented with clear evidence that this was a provocation, ignored that evidence. I myself now am viewing the materials uh, that the State Department had, the U.S. State Department, as a result of a Freedom of Information Act request. And it's obvious to me that they deliberately ignored the obvious information that was being provided to them and chose not to say anything. In that way, burying a terrorist act and creating the conditions for Putin to become dictator for life, which is what has happened. The uh, process that took place on the basis of this terrorist act during the 2000s was the steady concentration of power in the hands of the Putin regime. First, control over the means of mass information, especially state television, from which 90% of Russians get most of their information. The uh, subordination of the uh, Yeltsin-era oligarchs who could always be threatened with criminal prosecution in the style of Mikhail Khodorkovsky who was put, put in prison for 10 years uh, in an example of selective prosecution for offenses that were committed by all the oligarchs and uh, the limiting of uh, the rights of the regions with the abolition of the direct election of governors. And finally, with the invasion of Ukraine. Because in a, such a situation in which the levers of power are monopolized by the regime, there's only one recourse, really. And that's a massive, spontaneous, uh, and self-organizing revolt by uh, the population. Exactly what we witnessed in Ukraine in 2013 and 2014. The lessons of the Euromaidan revolt for the Russian population were all too obvious. And the way to distract the population was the, in the same way that they were distracted in 1999 by starting a war. That war is continuing today. So what we have in Russia is a country in which, of course, the forms of democracy are pursued are preserved, excuse me. But the, but the regime that exists is essentially terroristic. 
Of course, it doesn't use mass terror, and for the overwhelming majority of the population, there's nothing to fear at the moment. But under circumstances in which it's threatened, the 1999 apartment bombings, the invasion of, of Ukraine, in which, by the way, there are 10,000 people have been killed, are an indication of what they may be capable of in the future. This is a regime in which uh, a small number of people monopolize wealth and monopolize power, and which is acutely aware of its inherent vulnerability. And that's what mo motivates the second aspect of the regime, which is its attitude toward the West and its propaganda efforts to undermine Western institutions. The West often reacts with uh, bewilderment, bewilderment uh, at Russian attitudes. I wonder what, what is it that, that we've done to, to, to offend the Russians uh, in the way that we have. But the nature of Western institutions always will offend the Russians because the, the mere application of Western principles to Russia and the normal reaction of Western public opinion to violations of human rights which are endemic in Russia and in, unavoidable in, in, in the kind of system that Putin has created, uh, <clears throat> will present a challenge to, to, to the stability of the regime, which is based on corruption, propaganda, and selective terror. Under these circumstances, the best defense is a good offense. And one aspect of the offense is, of course, uh, the propaganda arm of the Russian government, particularly Russia Today, otherwise known as RT. Uh, Russia Today is the direct inheritor of uh, Radio Peace and Progress, which used to exist during the Soviet Union. I, I, was, when I, I was a correspondent in Moscow during the Soviet days. I had a friend, a young a woman, who worked in the letters department of Radio Peace and Progress, and she described for me the schizophrenic letters she used to get from readers all over the world who told her I'd listened to nothing but radio peace and progress since the Spanish Civil War. And I consider that it's the only objective source of information in the world. One person wrote, praised them for their objectivity and said that if, if they would send him $200,000, he would kill the president of Mexico. So it was just, uh, now we have of course, a much slicker operation. And RT has the good judgment not to try to do what Radio Peace and Progress did, which was to, to show the wonders of the Soviet experiment and the building of socialism. Radio, uh, RT simply tries to undermine the West. It d doesn't uh, waste its time trying to convince people that Russia is a paradise. And they do it rather success successfully. But the core, really, of our vulnerability in the West to this kind of propaganda assault, which can have political consequences, in fact, it has had some political consequences uh, in various situations, is that uh, uh, our, su our superficiality and timidity makes us vulnerable. The superficiality, of course, is reflected by those who uh, see the faults in their own government, see the faults in their own society, but have nothing to compare it with. Uh, as a result, they don't ask the question, who is making these criticisms and on what basis? Uh, nor do they understand that short, shortcomings, difficulties, uh, conflicts are endemic in any de democratic society and their importance should not be exaggerated. The other, th the, other, the other aspect, and it's one I personally came in contact with, is the readiness of, of, of Western governments to believe things, to believe the unbelievable. For example, that a, that a, a, a regime that uh, is capable of, of murdering 300 randomly chosen, chosen members of their own society in order to, to uh, hold on to power can be an exemplar of ch Christian values because they say they are. And that they can be a, a, a fully worthwhile partner in academic exchanges. I recently was scheduled to speak at uh, Sciences Po, the, the French Institute of Political Studies, 
and uh, the, uh, my speech was announced and then canceled, and not even because the Russians put pressure on Sian's Po. The, man, the, the leadership of Sian's Po anticipated the Russian reaction and censored themselves. By the way, thank you for not censoring me. <laughs> Glad to speak to you. <laughs> but after, 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 after Sion's Po, I ended up speaking to the French Foreign Ministry at the Quai d'Orsay, so I don't know what they're censoring. But uh, the, the, point, the point is that, we, you know, Orwell said uh, he nothing knows of England who only England knows. So if we really want to know about the West, and if, and if we really want to be able to resist Western propaganda, it's a good idea, actually, to know a little bit about Russia and to take a, a, a serious as opposed to superficial view of what goes on there. And certainly, don't allow their mimicry to, de to determine your impression of the society, because like a bear, which, which can appear to be friendly, it, uh, su such a regime is actually uh, actually very dangerous. When with that, I will close, and uh, I think we now have some other contributions, so I will uh, join you here. David, thank you very much indeed. Um.